my church, it's Pastor Mary, and welcome to this evening's Ask Me Anything. I will be answering three questions this evening. Uh, our questions are number one, do I believe in reincarnation? Or I think it was maybe like, what are my thoughts on reincarnation? Question number two, are we saved by grace? And what does works have to do with it? And question number three, do we have more than one life? Which I think the person who asked question one and question three intended that as a single question. I'm actually going to break it into two because I think um, I think it deser deserves <laughs> excuse me I think it deserves to be treated as two separate questions. So question number one: What are my thoughts on incarnation, reincarnation? So I'll tell you that I do not believe. In reincarnation I do not believe that's something that happens um, scripture doesn't talk about it however to to be gracious towards scripture not talking about it we also have to remember when and where and the context of scripture being written so the word Bible is a fancy word for library so when you're reading your Bible you're not reading a single book you're reading a library with multiple authors that spans thousands of years um, between writings and um, those writings came from cultures also spanning thousands of years along the Fertile Crescent Mediterranean culture, Judeo-Christian cultures. And the cultures that exist within our Bible that those authors are in conversation with are Mediterranean and Middle Eastern cultures. Um, the culture and religion that we see farthest east is the Persians. And the Persians are what is modern day Iran, but at the time the Persians and the Medes were a great empire that spanned a good chunk of the Middle East into Asia, and the main religion of the Persians was Zoroastrianism. Uh, we also see the Babylonians who were um, there in the Middle East as well. They are modern day Iraq. And uh, then we see kind of those um, Semitic religions. So the religions that were living, you know, Assyrians, Syrians, Hittites, those folks. And then we go east to the Greeks and the Romans. And then uh, there's also south, you know, the Egyptians are big players. Um, the Ethiopians are big players in the stories as well. So you have North African cultures. Those are the cultures and the religions that the Bible is in conversation with. You know, um, paganism. I mentioned Zoroastrianism already. Um, Canaanite faiths. Um, you have Gnosticism is a major religion that the Bible is in conversation with, particularly the Gospel of John. Um, the Egyptian pantheon. And for a while, the Egyptians were monotheists. And so uh, both of those religions lived within Egyptian faith and culture. And, and in those religions, reincarnation doesn't exist. And so I imagine, you know, reincarnation just doesn't live within the imagination of the biblical authors because they hadn't encountered it. Now, the reason that I find reincarnation problematic and, you know, and I, I just, I looked it up this morning, about one quarter of Christians, 25% of Christians roughly believe in a concept of reincarnation. I, I do find that problematic. Um, because reincarnation works when it's built on the concept of karma. And the idea of karma is that you have good acts and bad acts that weigh each other out, balance each other out through your lifespan or spans, plural, is a way to earn purification for your soul. 
And so we in the Western world who aren't familiar with the concepts of karma and reincarnation, we find this idea attractive, right? Oh, you know, we get another chance at life. We get another chance to get it right. We get another chance to balance out the scales and be good people. But for those religions, particularly Buddhism and Hinduism, where reincarnation and karma are big roles, big players in their faith, uh, that's actually a bad thing. Uh, being reincarnated is, is bad. The goal is to be united with God, with the divine. What you want to happen is to return to God's spirit because your soul is a piece of God living here. It's incarnate, right? Carnate, carnal. Are, it's embodied and you want your soul to return to God that's that's the goal of those Eastern faiths that follow the concept of reincarnation and the way that you return to God is by balancing out your karma and purifying your soul with good karma and so it's totally built on good action versus bad action and I I think that's attractive to Westerners, um, but it's not part of Christian faith. Um, in fact, many missionaries who go and work with particularly Buddhists and Hindus will talk about how God paid our karma because the, the concept of sin doesn't exist in those cultures. And so instead they talk about karma. God has paid your bad karma through Christ so that you may be united with God. You don't have to return to this world over and over and over again in order to reunite with the divine. God took care of that for you. And so um, for me, this, this concept of, of God paying that debt so that you don't have to keep earning your way to something that takes multiple lifetimes in order to reach God is this beautiful, gracious, glorious idea. God paid it for you. You know, and, and that leads me into our second question this evening. Are we saved through grace alone or is there some sort of work that we must do and and how do those interact with one another the short answer is that we are saved by grace alone right so if if we're talking about missionaries who go out to the east talking about how Jesus paid our karma we're saying the same thing here in the west with this concept of sin we are saved solely by God's grace and Christ's faithfulness, by God's faithfulness to us. And I think the confusion that comes is that we, at least in my experience of, of the churches that I've worked with, the churches that I've worshipped at, the churches I've interacted with, um, is that we we kind of confuse faith with faithfulness and they're not the same thing um, another way of putting it is we can conf we confuse salvation so that would be faith with discipleship and that's faithfulness and so we are saved by the by god by God's grace, God's faithfulness, God's never failing love and grace and faith in us. That is how we're saved, by God's grace and God's grace alone. But God calls us not just to be saved, right? This isn't just a story about getting to heaven. God also calls us to live resurrected faithful lives of discipleship. So a disciple is just another word for a student. 
God is asking us to be students of God's grace, of Christ's love, and Christ's life. So Christ came to teach us what it means to love God. And we as Christians, as little Christs, that's what the word Christian means, <laughs> as disciples, are called to be students of that teacher, that master. And that's where the works come in. And so the works are not an action of earning salvation. God's already given that. So think with me, you know, back to the Exodus story. When God sends Moses to Pharaoh and tells Pharaoh to let his people go, um, and there's this huge conflict, and the plagues come, and finally Pharaoh lets them go. God splits open the water, sends them out into the desert, and God rescues them from Pharaoh. Hebrews, at that time, were not practicing Jewish faith in the way you and I understand it. That faith didn't even exist at that time. So God frees the people freely of God's own will, God's own grace, for no other reason than that he loves them. And he's bringing justice and freedom to them out of his love. And he takes them out into the desert, which in Jewish tradition... Um, is considered God's honeymoon period with his people, uh, with his bride, the people of God. And the very first thing God does, you know, after feeding them and giving water to them, making sure that they're cared for, is hands over the Torah, the law, and tells them this is how to love me, and one another. I have freed you in order to be loved and to love. And so our works as people of faith is not a way for us to earn righteousness or salvation or grace from God. Our work is the fruit of God's labor in us. A disciple of God bears God's fruit. You wouldn't see an apple tree bearing oranges. You wouldn't see a pear tree bearing peaches. And so if we're people of God, we bear God's fruit. That's the work that we're doing. And so the, the way that we bear that fruit, Christ tells us, is to love God with our entire beings. Everything that we are, all the things that make us up in our identities, love God wholeheartedly. And, Jesus says, we love our neighbors as ourselves, as our own flesh, as our own family, as our own breath. We're called to love the people around us. I think sometimes... We as Christians, we get really caught up in this salvation part and in this concept of, I'm a Christian so I can go to heaven. And I find that fascinating because Jesus doesn't actually spend a lot of time talking about that. What Jesus talks about is living a resurrected life. And really, that brings us back to that third question. Do we live more than one life? And the answer is yes. When we're brought to life, to true life by the grace of God, we live a resurrected life. 
Because you see, resurrection isn't just uh, this destination that we're waiting for after we die. Um, heaven is not resurrected life. The afterlife is not resurrected life. Resurrected life is the life that comes when God takes those dead things within us and pulls them out and cleans us up and breathes new breath into us and makes all things new within us. And we begin this discipleship journey. That's when resurrected life starts and it changes us. And friends, that's not a destination either. That's a journey. That is a lifetime journey that every single one of us walks. And we do this in hope of, yes, one day reaching an afterlife when we can be in the presence of God fully, but more importantly, in hope of that day when Christ will return and will make all things new, not just within us, but within the entire created order. When redemption comes in its fullest extent and we are resurrected into new life, just as Jesus was on Easter morning. And that is our second life. The life that we take on fresh and abundant and overflowing and the grace of God no longer worried or afraid or attempting to earn something that simply can't be earned, not because we aren't worthy, but because it's already been gifted. God has already given us this gift, and so there's nothing that we need to earn because it's already here for us, unconditionally. And all God asks us in return is to become a student who's changed by the teachings of their master. Jesus paid it for you. Jesus took it on for you. Jesus breathed a new life into you. And we live these lives not for righteousness sake but because love changes us this evening I pray that God will continue to show unconditional love toward you that you will see the ways in which God is renewing you, resurrecting you, and bringing forth new, precious, and glorious life. And may you be made whole.